Last in the world. No, oh, the world looks pretty good. For the most part. And just strolling around the world map might be one of the best part of the game. Yep, I just said this game works better as a walking simulator rather than an RPG. It really holds up, still to this day, and there's a couple of impressive and unique landscapes. Places like the waterfalls near Silden, the hidden pass to Nordmar, the streets of Morasul, and the mountain east of Montera. And on the music. Like in 1 and 2, the music is composed by Kai Hosenkans, but while in Gothic 1 and 2 it was played by virtual instruments and was subtle and laid back, here it's epic and in your face right from the moment you boot the game up. A big budget must have been spent this time around since there's a real orchestra playing the tunes and yeah, this soundtrack is quite impressive. It still suffers uh, like most soundtracks in open world games from starting to be very repetitive very soon. Uh, the breast section in one of the combat themes nearly drove me insane. <laughs> It's still amazing, and the fact that something like the Vista Point track manages to work uh, even when being tonally inconsistent really is a testament of how good it is. Hell, just replaying the intro and looting the first village while the music plays in the background always manages to make me go, why I don't like this game again? It really is that good. Too bad it only takes like 10 minutes for the game to remind me why. Ah! Part 5. And now for something completely different. Now, yeah, they changed the formula entirely, but th that is not necessarily a problem. I mean, I'm all for innovation, and holy shit that we need a bit of that in today's AAA's market. But you need to make sure that what you're doing is actually something that works in its own right, instead of stretching your past ideas over a gigantic map and sacrificing every bit of depth in the process. And since this is where Gothic 3 really fails to meet expectations, I'm gonna need to use the past games as a frame of reference. As I already said, Gothic 1 and 2 were first and foremost narrative-driven experiences. Yeah, the world was open but it served more as a gigantic set in which to tell the story in. No matter how much you managed to get sidetracked, it all tied in with the overall plot and it all functioned in relation to it to an extent. Here, the open world is the real protagonist of the game. The story took the backseat and became just another quest buried at the bottom of your journal. You are given context for what is happening and then you're just free to explore the huge map. Yep, they basically Elder Scrolled Gothic. It's the same basic concept with some tweaks here and there. You remember when Bilbo said, I feel thin, sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. Yeah, playing Gothic 3 feels like eating that gigantic slice of bread. The one thing I actually appreciated is the seamless world, there's no loading screens whatsoever. And while it does wonders for the immersion factor, a performance paid the price. Really the frame rate is fucking horrible in certain places. Now, since this is an open world experience, what you're gonna do for most of the time is exploring. I still remember when I got to Silden for the first time, and I saw the ruins of a castle or something on the top of a hill. I remember feeling like I finally found an interesting forgotten place to explore, but when I got there it was only a bunch of rubbles, with some mobs and a chest with random stuff in it. And it was there where I seriously started wondering if there really was nothing to find in the whole map. And unfortunately I was right. I don't know if this is caused by the lack of loading screens or time restraints, but there's close to no dungeon crawling. Most caves are copy pasted and are just grey and featureless and very small. And the closest thing to a dungeon are the forgotten temples. You have no fucking idea how underwhelming it was to see these colossal ziggurats reminiscent of Jarkandar from Night of the Raven, only to enter and realize they are composed by a bunch of short corridors and maybe a small room at the end. And that's basically it. There's also a bunch of viking tombs with skeletons in it. I mean, I'm not saying they should be mandatory, but having some interesting dungeons can really help keeping a huge game as varied as possible. Not here, just a bunch of featureless caves. And to finish off every hope of having at least a rewarding experience while exploring, the loot system. All loot inside chests is predetermined, meaning no matter what chest you open, you won't find good shit until you open all of them. And mind you, the best weapons in the game are inside chests. Let's say there's a hundred rare chests in the game, you will only find the epic weapons when you open all of them. There's no epic quest involved, nothing. It's just grinding chests. Now that you need to look for weapons, I mean the whole bird is just fine. But holy shit, I remember like finding a paladin sword in a cave near the beginning, some useless helmets in a cave in Nordmar, and that's really it. 
They also changed the three faction system. It's not about joining a faction and seeing the events of the main story unfold under a specific point of view anymore. No, 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 no. Now, what you have is again three major factions the rebels, the orcs, yes, you can actually ally with the orcs, and the hashishin. And what you do is complete quests and eventually free cities to grind faction points and unlock new armor sets. And that's it. By the way, all the armors look like shit. There's the basic helmet that looks like a crappy rubber viking hat you can buy for cheap at a costume shop. Oh my god, you look like a fucking LARPer. Most of the game is basically go to a town, complete all the mundane quests and move to the next. Here's a rundown of some of the quests in the first cities of the game. Reddock, kill four boars, defeat two guys in the arena, gather ten healing plants. Cape Dunn, kill ten wolves, defeat two guys in the arena, gather three crates. Gather 10 healing plants, gather 10 wolf pelts, Montera, gather 10 milk barrels, gather 10 wheat sacks, kill 10 wolves, defeat 5 guys in the arena, let's just move to one of the last places you will visit, kill 3 wolves, it's a fucking morpg, every single quest boils down to kill this, get me this, or escort someone, there's no attempt to give an overall narrative context, an interesting premise, nothing, you do it because they pay money and reputation, Exactly like in an MMO. The only half interesting quest I can think of is the guy who needs a book on how to build the ships. And even if at the end it turns out to be a weird joke, at least it's actually something more interesting than kill X monsters. Now to explain how big the nose dive the quest design took here, let's analyze how questing was designed in the past games. Take the turnip quest at the beginning of Gothic 2. It's a very simple fetch quest on a mechanical level, but it has context and it's designed to serve a narrative purpose first. You need to get inside the harbor town, but you have no money. So the farmer tells you that he can sell you farmer clothing that will allow you to get in, and you can get a discount if you agree to harvest his fields. Already there's a tangible reason why the character would do a quest like that. It makes sense in the context of the situation. But it doesn't stop here. You then bring the turnips to the wife that will task you with getting her a pen from a vendor nearby. The vendor will offer you a pass to get into the city for free. If you accept, he will then blackmail you inside town and force you to plant a false document into a merchant's inventory so that he can put her out of business. Then you can proceed the way you want, you can report him to the militia, you can do what he says or just ignore him. If you don't do anything, he will later tell the merchants in Corinis that you're an ex convict and they won't trade with you anymore. This is just one simple minor side quest and it was better designed than old quest in Gothic 3. It has long term repercussions, yes like in The Witcher 3, and both a mechanical and a narrative reason to exist within the continuity of the game itself. The quests in Gothic 2 were so fucking well designed in fact that it really makes me wonder if the guy who created them was still around when Gothic 3 was developed. The quality of the dialogues, as you might have noticed, also took a nosedive. And I really think it can all be summarized by this line of dialogue. Tell me more about the war. There isn't much to say about that, my friend. There's not much to say about the war. Hey, tell me about World War 2. Oh, there's not much to say about it. I hope the guy who wrote that line was baked or something, because I really cannot believe a human being wrote that down and thought, yeah, that's a believable sentence. It really feels like George Lucas wrote the fucking dialogues. You want to see an example of how you do that the right way? Here's my favorite line of dialogue in Gothic 2. In the fourth chapter, there's a dragon hunter that comes from Merthana, and you can ask him how the situation is in the mainland, since you have zero information about it. And this is how we explain what is happening there. The situation there is getting worse. The orcs leave nothing but burned out villages behind. The king has lost control of his realm. The orcs are outside the capital. But whether it's fallen yet, I don't know. The last thing I heard was that the king is dead, but I don't believe that. Notice that he says they say the king is dead, not the king is dead. That's extremely important and it gives the dialogue credibility. He tells you what the rumors are. It's not just a bland statement. And at the same time it gives indirectly more depth to the character of the king. This guy doesn't want to believe the king really is dead. There's a sense of hope in this line. 
with only one fucking line of dialogue, they conveyed how grim the situation is in the mainland and how this guy is genuinely worried about what might be happening at that very moment in his homeland. Hell, this dialogue pictures what is happening in Gothic 3 in a more interesting way than Gothic 3 itself. There's no attention to details, I'm still surprised no one noticed that the continent where the warship Esmeralda comes from has zero harbor cities. Yeah, there's not a single city with a fucking harbor. There's no mention of the Claw of Beliar or the Eye of Venus in the whole game. Why there's dragons hidden around the map? Where is my ponytail? Did Gorn give me a haircut on the ship while we were taking a bath in the hot tub together? Also the setting and the premise make so little sense compared to the past games that it makes me wonder if there even is a German word for consistency. The game is set in a land that has just been conquered by orcs and instead of being a return to the hostile society of the colony, it's like being in a Saturday morning cartoon. For some fucking reason they decided that the orcs, a race that tried to obliterate humanity from the face of the earth for a thousand years, is now cool with allying with humans. Because orcs can talk now. How you ask? Good question. The orcs treat you way better than how the convict treated you in the colony, yep. The orcs aren't strong anymore and while the mechanic that allowed you to defeat someone or be defeated without necessarily dying it's still here, it's not used as a tool for immersion anymore for some reason. One of the things that made Gothic 1 so great was the idea of making you experience how weak and powerless you were at the beginning. You were trapped in a dome with some of the worst scum of the known world and everyone wanted to fuck with you and you could do nothing about it for the first half of the game. I cannot put to words how satisfying the mass slaughter of dickheads I caused in the second half of the game was. There's almost not a single game still to this day that realized that the moment when you overcome an obstacle it's so much more impactful if you first make the player experience how it feels not to be able to overcome that very same obstacle first. I keep telling you, this bunch of stoners figured out the Souls formula 10 years before the Souls games themselves. And playing their more recent games makes me really wonder if it was just a pure fucking coincidence. I cannot stress this enough. It doesn't feel like you are in a war zone. They try to make it look like it, but it doesn't feel like it. Basically no one will ever bother you in town unless you start a fight. I mean they should be enslaving every single human they can get their hands on. It should feel extremely oppressive, but no, it's also flat and boring. As I already said, you don't commit to a faction anymore, you just hop from city to city and complete mundane tasks. You can also drive the orcs away from the cities for the rebels and you can destroy rebel camps for the orcs. But the only reason why you wanna do that is to unlock new armor. That's literally all the reputation system does, besides allowing you to talk with the leaders of the orcs and the Ashishins. To get the best armor in the game you just need to farm reputation points. You see the best armor after 10 minutes, as in every leader's trading inventory in a rebel camp or an orc city. Oh yeah, and the third faction, the Ashishin. They make no fucking sense. They apparently took the place of the inhabitants of the Southern Isles, since they talk exactly like them. And they also worship Beliar. Yeah, I repeat, humans worshipping Beliar. Maybe I'm going crazy or something, but I distinctly remember Vatras hammering in the concept of Enos, the god of mankind, and Beliar, the god of the beast, inside the citizen of Karinis brain. I always thought that all humans worshipping Beliar were kind of mind controlled or something, but no, there's an entire population worshipping the god who wants to see mankind erased from the face of the earth. I mean, it's not like it's a big deal. The shit about the gods is by far the most confusing and inconsistent consistent part of the whole trilogy. We are the gods are yet again the focus of the main campaign. Part six the story! Now there isn't much to the plot and what we have is again not what they had in mind. So basically the first objective is to find Zardas and you have no clue where he is so you have to follow a trail that forces you to travel across the whole Mertana and get to know the main players in this big war. It's a fairly long quest unless your eyes happen to be facing the screen while the game loads. On one of the screenshots, and I'm not making this up mind you, they show a black evil looking structure, probably a tower, framed in such a way that you can see it's surrounded by snow. Okay, Zardas had two defining traits, a voice that can cause earthquakes, and a weird love for living in huge black towers. I mean, when I saw it the first time I thought, nope, 
No, they didn't just put a screenshot of the goal of your first main mission. Just, just for the fun of it, let's try to go north. And I want this to be a joke, but it isn't. I found it at level 3. Oh no, there's a golem blocking the road. I'll just, I'll just open the inventory when he shoots snowballs at me and I just run past him. It's like making a Where's Waldo game and putting a screenshot of where Waldo is in the loading screen. Anyway, you finally meet Zardas after what is supposed to be weeks. And he just says that we need to decide who will win the War of the Gods, even if we have been fighting Barrier for two games. And now you need to find the five MacGuffins of Adanos, because good riding would require actual talent. And if you're interested in knowing how exactly he allied with the orcs, or why the orcs in particular, and not, I don't know, the humans, well, uh, my answer is yes. Now it's a collectathon. There's three artifacts in the desert, one in a town in Marthana, and one in a mound in Nordmar. And when you get to the desert, you realize how they made this 70 square kilometers map by putting a giant huge desert in it that covered more than half the game world. I'm not kidding, you can literally see the game world slowly becoming a polygonal wasteland the more you go south. You might ask what the role of our companion is in this whole story. Not much really, they just stand or sit in a spot being really bored. Okay, Diego helps you hunt lurkers and then he sits there. Milton hangs in the monastery of fire. Lester helps you get in a temple and then goes uh, to stone or heaven. Darius gets a facial surgery. Vatras Michael Jackson the shit out of his melanine. Gorn helps you free a skeleton ridden city. Angar becomes an arena boss. And Lee helps you kill the king later. And nope, I never figured out what happened between him and the king. Anyway, after an extremely exciting collectathon that turns the game into a nightmarish version of Dynasty Warriors where you are a grunt like everyone else, you bring the stuff to Zardas, and then you need to pick a god. If you choose Inos, you need to free the cities from the orcs, kill <laughs> who's the leader of the orcs, and the leader of the Ashishins, who lives in a city called Ishtar, and then you win. If you choose Beliar, you know the gods who you have been fighting for two games, you kill everyone and then you win. And if you choose Zadas or Adanos, I don't even know anymore, you need to go to Mordor and destroy the artifacts of Adanos by casting them in the fires of Mount Doom. But between you and Mount Doom there's an army of orcs that it's not interested in what faction you joined. Yep, you need to fight the orcs even if you ally with them. Even if Zadas is their leader or buddy, I don't really know what Zadas is. Let's just stop trying to make sense of this mess. Anyway, with this done, you need to banish the avatars of Barrier and in, uh, Innes, and so you win. You, you, that's how you banish the gods from the world. Probably the fact that Adonis already did banish the two spoiled brothers during the creation of the world just wasn't enough. But wait a second, I hear you whisper in my ear. Zadas is the avatar of Beria. He stole the soul of the dragon. And I was the avatar of Inos. Oh wait, maybe it was the avatar of Adanos. It's pretty unclear. Make it stop, my brain hurts. So are you supposed to push Zadas down the stairs and then commit suicide? No, because apparently the avatars of Inos and Beria can change according to what the plot needs. Yep, now the avatar of Inos is the king and the avatar of Beliar is the leader of the Ashishins. A human. Yes, a human! So you kill them, you take their sticks, and then you leave the world with Zadas. There's no boss fight, no climax, nothing. You bring the old guy out for a walk until you reach a rock, then you click on it and the game just ends. There's no ending cutscene, just a hastily put together slideshow, Fallout 1 style. Orcs keep killing humans, humans keep killing orcs, and orcs and humans learn how to live together. Fucking flawless! Bam! The end, after the credits the game even terminates itself. Yeah, you get kicked back to the desktop while the game commits an off-screen suicide. Ah, <sighs> playing this trilogy has been like rooting for the north in Game of Thrones and holy shit what a red wedding this game was. And it's really a pity, under the mountain of bugs and glitches, you can sometime catch glimpses of what great game Gothic 3 could have been. But this is how unfortunately the story goes. PB lost the rights to the high P to Jovud, and they just moved on by creating a new saga called Risen. But it doesn't matter how much the fans deny it, this is not the end of Gothic. Jovud, probably inspired by the Mary Shelley novels, decided to dig the corpse of the Gothic saga and create something that defies explanation. It's true what they say, you either die a hero 
or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain.